Well, greetings, everyone. Okay, here's some trivia for you. This is from uh, science.howstuffworks.com. <clears throat> and, it, and it's how the brain works. And it goes like this. Every animal you can think of, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, amphibians, has a brain. But the human brain is unique. Although it's not the largest, it's about the size of a head of cauliflower, or in some cases, maybe a bowl of oatmeal. It gives us power to speak, imagine, and problem solve. It's truly an amazing organ. The brain performs an incredible number of tasks, including the following. It controls body temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, and breathing. It accepts a flood of information about the world around you from your various senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching. And it also handles your physical movement when you walk, talk, stand, or sit. It lets you think, dream, reason, and experience emotions. Your brain is made of approximately 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. And the ne these neurons have the amazing ability to gather and transmit electrochemical signals. Think of them like gates and wires in a computer. These neurons also share the same characteristics and have the same makeup as other cells, but the electrochemical aspect lets them transmit signals over a long distance. Uh, sometimes several feet or a few meters, and send messages to each other. That's the synapse snapping, I, I suppose, in the brain. Further, your, your brain generates through that electrical, electrochemical process anywhere between 12 and 25 watts of electricity, depending on whether you're asleep or awake. That's enough to light a light bulb, or not, in some cases. My feeble attempt at humor is just to stress the point that sometimes all of us, we don't use this thing sitting in this gourd on top of our head to the, to the best of its ability or its capacity. <clears throat> okay, another bit of uh, trivia is that as we noodle our way through life, assuming all the gears are engaged, uh, one estimate says, and this is a rough estimate, you, it's, an, it's the figure that keeps popping up if you look this up on the internet, is we make about 3,500 choices a day. You have to think about that a second because we do make a whole bunch of choices. Obviously, we make conscious and unconscious choices every waking moment. But the sense I'm referring to is those spiritual choices we make each and every day because we do that. Uh, you know, if we're converted, if, we're, if we've been baptized, if we have God's Holy Spirit, we do that. Uh, and sometimes we don't even think about it. Hopefully we don't think about it too much. We just do those things. Like Chip mentioned, you know, our standards uh, should be godly standards. Our behavior should be godly. <laughs> but also, and, and again, you may not have, uh, have uh, looked at it this way, but, you know, in that calling, you know, God gives us his Holy Spirit spirit, but it gives us the freedom to make these choices. It's kind of wired in, so to speak. You know, what do we used to call that? Free moral agency? Sure. <laughs> but the, you know, the Bible, God's word is full of these, of these choices, these spiritual choices, good and bad. We have all kinds of uh, characters in the Bible. Uh, sometimes uh, I have uh, several books in my library, and they're all about the characters in the Bible. I like Lockyer's series, all the men, women, children, all that of the Bible. But coupled with God's Holy Spirit, we do have this freedom of choice. And I title this Spiritual Choices, if you like a title. But when we, again, when we do think about that, this whole topic, we do realize that from the moment we're baptized, we make ongoing spiritual choices our whole life, the rest of our lives, until we die. Uh, someone asked me one time, not uh, too long ago, I had mentioned in a, a scripture in John 4 where it talked about worshiping God in spirit and truth. And they said, uh, the question was, how do you worship God in spirit? And, and, and oddly, I didn't have a ready answer. <laughs> My first thought was, what have you been doing? <laughs> the, but the point is, every day in our lives, we walk, uh, we follow God. We committed to do that. So we make these choices. That's what drives us. Uh, what motivates us in our lives? Let's look at a few scriptures to kind of get a flavor for this topic. I'd like to turn over to James. James chapter 1. You know, James is a very practical book. Uh, it gave the early Protestant, Protestant reformers, 
it, it, it ran counter to the faith alone ideas that they were promote, promoting at that time. So they didn't like the book of James. But in James 1, I'll be using the New King James. Let's begin in verse 1. Where it said, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. And we know that's referring to the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews, the Israelites from their homeland. <clears throat> but aren't we, a, aren't we a scattered church today? I don't... <laughs> Every, every time you, you kind of uh, look into that or do a search on the Internet or ask someone, uh, years ago it was like 300 different splits, and now it's, up, I don't know, 800. You hear different figures. Uh, but we're scattered church. <clears throat> but James is, again, it's a how-to epistle. It tells us how we function as a scattered church. Going on in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. <clears throat> Talks about learning patience through trials. That's one of the primary elements of trials. I don't know about you, but <laughs> sometimes we just have to be patient as we cope with the trial that we're going through. <clears throat> And, and a lot of times we, we, we learn from those mistakes that we made, and maybe, and maybe we've gotten ourselves in a trial. It's a self-made one. <laughs> but we learn from those. Actually, we're learning from those bad choices. I, I have a, an example. You know, I was the military. I was, I was Navy. You know, I was young. I didn't know any better. <laughs> Navy loves us kids, right? <clears throat> Anyhow, I... I spent, uh, I spent some time on an air base in San Diego, and then I was transferred to the fleet and uh, to destroyers. I became a tin can sailor. Uh, and all churches, you can go to the Navy website, and all churches, if you know the name, you can plug that in, and it gives the history of, of any ship. But the ship that I was uh, billeted to at that time, had, uh, it was setting at anchor in a harbor in Okinawa, and it was hit by a kamikaze came out of the sun at sunset. They probably heard it before they ever saw it. Slammed into the ship at 300 miles an hour. Uh, <laughs> the point being that this, this skipper, he made a bad choice by setting an anchor like that. You remember Pearl Harbor just happened. Those, those folks in, in Pearl Harbor were sitting ducks. They were either sitting at anchor or they were tied up at a pier. <clears throat> and, and, and what about the bad health? You know, a lot of us have health issues of one kind or another. You know, maybe that's a result of poor choices and we need to change something. <laughs> verse 5, continuing James 1, verse 5. If any, of you, if any of you lacks wisdom, you know, wisdom for what? Well, how about making right choices? Let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach and, will be, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Just can't make up the mind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Kind of reminds you of the parable of the talents where one individual did nothing. And <laughs> if you make no choice at all, that in fact is a choice. Verse 9. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Doesn't matter who you are. That verse tells, tells us that there's no status games with God. There just isn't. Verse 10. But the rich in his humiliation, because as the flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than the grass withers. Its flower fall, falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuit. We all have the same end. They, it, it, in a physical sense, that's our station in life. We're all going to die. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. It's injecting eternal life. Right there, James is telling us. Which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. You know, evil's not in, in God's character and in his nature. He would never choose to do something evil, nor would he influence us to do that. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires, you know, the lust, the things in our nature, our carnal nature, and enticed. Verse 15, then when desire has conceived, that lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, 
And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You know, in Proverbs 7, it talks about lust is personified as a seductive harlot uh, that leads us into bad choices, when you think about that. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Deceived by Satan. Of course, he deceived Eve into making a bad choice. She disobeyed God. She ate of the tree that God said, don't eat that. And she, she, was, she was influenced and enticed to do that. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. <laughs> Unlike Satan, you know, God's nature is to be giving with these gifts. One of which is that freedom to make the choices that we have in life. We're faced with those every each and every day. He could deny that, but he doesn't choose to do that, as we'll see. Okay, going on, the, uh, the rest of verse 17. And comes down from the Father of lights, those, those gifts, those perfect gifts, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. There's never any hint of God changing. You know, God always chooses right, always. 18, verse 18. Of his own will, he chose. He brought us forth by the word of truth. And just a couple of reference scriptures talking about truth here. John 8, verse 31, 32. And these are references. Uh, you know, where, where Christ is, the Pharisees are arguing with, arguing with Christ. And in verse 31 of John 8 said, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, the, the Jews, the Pharisees had, had lots of religion, but they missed the point completely. They missed the point. And, but the last part of verse 18, that we may be a kind of first fruits, fruits of his creatures. We'll talk about truth a little bit later. But going down, on down in uh, verse 19, and I'd like to read this from the, through to verse 27 from the NLT. <clears throat> the NLT puts it, Verse 19 of James 1, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to, to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness of God, of godly desires. Controlling our emotions, anger, is being a powerful one. What usually happens when we're angry? <laughs> In the heat of the moment, we, we make really bad choices. We do things that we, uh, uh, we regret later. I have, an, I have a personal example of that. We have a three-car garage, a double and then a single garage. And, of course, between the, the double and the single, there's a, there's a walk-through door, an entry door, and then one to the outside. Well, with the big door open and the wind's blowing, uh, it, it will slam one of the doors or the other. And one day I was going through there, and uh, the, the, outer, the outside door slammed really, really hard on my finger. And, and I said, Chihuahua, Chihuahua, several times. And when I tell that story, my wife says, he didn't say that at all. He said something. <laughs> but boy, you, you talk about an immediate smashed finger. <laughs> okay. Verse 21. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. For through it, or through God's Holy Spirit, has the power to save your soul. He's talking about eternal lives there. Verse 22, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Chip addressed that in the sermonette. Our, our standards, you know, we're accountable to God for what we do. And we do those things as a result of the choices we make. <clears throat> Other, continuing in verse 22, otherwise you're only fooling yourself. <laughs> you know, you know if, if God's Holy Spirit is, is, is operating in our minds each and every day, we make Conscious choice, choices every waking moment. We have many, many examples of that. I could, I, I could finish the whole sermon here with just those examples. But let's go on to verse 23. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like gl glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. <laughs> and, the, and the point there is to me when I read that is, is we don't see ourselves like God sees us. We just don't. <laughs> he sees the changes that we need to make. <laughs> and sometimes we have to we have to go through some some trials, some other things to kind of to kind of you know get the old uh, two before up alongside the head and make the changes that we need to make. But that takes effort. It takes choosing to be like God, to follow Christ's example. Verse twenty five. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, make those right choices again. Uh, <laughs> And don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. 
If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. That's what James is telling them. In other words, if you, you can fool yourself by thinking that that person looking back in the mirror at you every morning, I see that old guy, he gets older all the time, <laughs> but <laughs> you, 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 what James is, is saying, what I think he's trying to say here is, is, is you look at that individual looking back at you and, and you think, well, I'm okay. Well, we're not. <laughs> You know, we're, we're in the process of being converted, of being changed. You know, it, people will say, well, I read God's word religiously every day, or I pray religiously every day. Isn't that enough? <laughs> well, <laughs> you mean to tell me that James says I have to act on what I read and <laughs> what I understand? <laughs> well, yeah, yes, we do. We know that. Verse 27, pure and genuine religion. It's the only kind that counts. In the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress, doing something for those that really need it. Chip mentioned that in the sermonette, amazingly. <laughs> and refusing to, or choosing not to, let the world corrupt you. Uh, King James says, the old King James says, unspotted. In other words, exhibiting God's nature more than the nature of Satan, the, the that inspires the world around us. And remember, that's what the part of what the millennium teaches. That's what we're doing here. <clears throat> so God, God's given us many gifts like that. And one, of, one uh, is expressed by the fact that we're all sitting here. We chose to be here. I don't know about you, but we chose to be here. <laughs> he gave us the understanding of the holy days, and we acted on that. We made a conscious choice. We're going to the feast. We're going to be with the uh, brethren that we want to be with. <clears throat> Another facet of choosing. I don't have points. I leave all the points to Rick. He takes all the points if you ever listen closely to him. We well, doesn't leave any points for the rest of us. <laughs> Usually five points. <laughs> Another facet of choosing. What about truth? Can we or maybe better said, do we have the freedom to choose our own truth? Do we? Someone, someone will say, well, that's kind of a loaded question, Jack. <laughs> of course the answer is no. We don't have the option when it comes to God's truth, as it's shown to us in, in Scripture. I have a few quick references. These are references. Uh, you can jot them down. Uh, don't try to turn there. <laughs> I'm going to go pretty fast. John 17, 17, <clears throat> where Christ is praying for his disciples. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. It's, it's not, it's not, God's word is not option one, option two, option three, whatever you want it to be. But it, down in verse 19 of John 17, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified again by the truth. In John 14, verse six, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. And in John 4, 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23, well-known scripture. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Scriptural truth, biblical truth, as God reveals to us, always comes with a price. I don't know whether you've noticed that or not. I think, I think many of us have noticed that. It comes with a price. <laughs> and, and what do I mean by that? What do I mean by it comes with a pride? Well, we see it today. Uh, and actually, I'm going it, to, it's, it's happened in the past. We're, it's, it's not, we're, not, uh, we're not unique to this issue, this problem. But we see it today if someone digs into Scripture and sees what it actually says, it invariably runs counter to, to, an, to the established organization or to organizational belief system and whoever does that is going to suffer. You're just going to. That's, and again, that's not a new phenomenon. Most Bible students are familiar with the uh, BDB, Brown, Driver, Briggs, Hebrew Dictionary. Uh, one of the co-authors of that work, uh, Charles Augustus Briggs, 1841 to 1913, he was a biblical scholar. Uh, uh, he was a Presbyterian minister uh, at cemetery, uh, cemetery, cemetery. Who talked about cemetery? Oh, Chuck. <laughs> Chip. Presbyterian minister and a seminary pro professor 
who was the one, one of the first Americans to master historical, critical approaches to scripture. In 1893, he was tried for heresy. His crime? Well, he worked out a method to scientifically approach biblical scholarship. Uh, he, he used an approach that was driven by open and fearless search of truthful interpretation of Scripture. What it says, not what someone says it says. That's what he did. And he was persecuted for that. And in fact, he was, de he was defrocked for that. <laughs> and, he, and he goes on to say, he said this, this search shouldn't be governed by inherited doctrine, but through the use of linguistic, ling, ling, linguist, linguistic, I'll get it. My mouth's getting dry up here. Historical and archaeological tool. In other words, the tools that are out there so you can, you can see and interpret Scripture the way it should be, not what someone says it should be. And note he was a Presbyterian. Well, here's a, here's a uh, I have a book, uh, Modern Religion. I, I can't remember the title exactly, but it's something like that. Uh, Today's Religion. Anyhow, here, here's, here's what it says about the Presbyterian system of governing and decision making. It's by a board of elders. They're the primary authority. That's the Greek, the Presbyteros, translated elders, as we see in Scripture. This system emphasizes the importance of elders. They decide doctrine. That might sound familiar. <laughs> but Charles Briggs, he rocked the, the traditional boat, and he was defrocked for that. And then he, then, then, <laughs> to me it's kind of humorous, but I wasn't in his shoes then. But <laughs> he, he kind of went from the firing frying pan to the fire, because then he migrated over to the Episcopalians. And here's, here's their system. Uh, <clears throat> Episcopalianism is a hierarchical system of government and decision-making in which the denominational leaders are the primary authority. That's the, what we see in Scripture, the Greek episkopos, a translated bishop or overseer. And and the irony of that is that, that most Christians accept that form of government more than any other church, more than any other church type of government. That's what, it's a top-down structure. They accept that. Again, that might sound familiar. But, you know, Briggs' story, that's not untypical, untypical at all of honest scholars everywhere. It's been said, and I'll quote this, the history of the Christian church can be traced in the blood of its scholarly martyr, martyrs. There's a price to pay. If you actually interpret scripture and, and accept that truth. <clears throat> Tens of thousands, maybe millions have been tortured, imprisoned, and, 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 and murdered in the name of dogma through the, throughout the history of the church, of the Christian church. In another book that Briggs authored, he listed what he called the obstacles to the study of Holy Scripture. To the study of what it actually says. And here's what he said. Uh, well, one item that he listed is called sectarian partisanship. He went on to write, A sin against the Bible is often committed by the indiscriminate use of proof text in dogmatic assertion and debate. These texts are hurled against one another by zealous partisans in controversy with such differences and inconsistency of interpretation which disgusts any open-minded person, <laughs> or should. He's talking about the, politi the politicization of dogmatic doctrine. And what happens when somebody threatens that political uh, structure, those interests and the power of that authority? You get hammered. <laughs> that's, what, that's what any politics do at, at any age. That's what they do. Uh, remember, uh, remember the incident, uh, and this is over in John 18, uh, verse 37, 38. Uh, you don't need to turn there if you, unless you like to. But that's the, that's the account where Pilate is, is questioning Christ. <clears throat> Verse 37 of John 18 says, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered. He said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he said this, he, of course, we know the story went out again to the Jews, find no fault in him. Well, Pilate was a politician, right? <laughs> The answer he wanted was uh, something he had to weigh the, the version of the truth. That the, <laughs> he wanted his own version. He had his own agenda. He had to, he had to worry about either pleasing, the, uh, pleasing Rome or pleasing the Jews. So he was just a politician. That's what he did. But the, again, the point is, is we can't have multiple versions of scriptural truth. 
It just doesn't work. You can't choose the facts to suit yourself or your agenda. You can't do that. You can't get away with it. We think we can, but you can't do that. Truth is truth. It's either pure <coughs> or not, scripturally speaking. Not up to us to decide what's true. It just isn't. <coughs> Politicians, you know, just turn on your TV. Politicians invent their own truth, right? They'll, re they'll rearrange the, fact, the facts each and every day to suit their own agenda. But we can't get away with that scripturally. <clears throat> Sometime read the, just thinking about this, about choices that people make. Uh, just sometime with this thought and with that thought in mind, read the whole chapter of Hebrews 11. And just think about following God's truth, following God's way of life with those individuals there. Here's just one from that list in uh, Hebrews 11. We're very familiar with that. But in Hebrews 11, verse 24, it says this about Moses. Moses. He says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And continuing in verse 25, it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Again, I like, I like uh, Lockyer's book, uh, All the Men in the Bible. He states in his book that Moses, uh, he lived 120 years, three 40-year segments. The first 40 years, he was a prince in Egypt. You know, all the perks, all the bells and whistles, the limousines, the servants, all of that. The finest hotels. I'm not getting a smile at all. <laughs> and then he, then he spent 40 years herding Jethro's goats. You know, he, <laughs> I'm sure he was used to the uh, goat ganu in his sandals. <laughs> and then he spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. That was Moses' life. Every one of those phases in his life, he had to make choices. We have that history. We have the record in the Bible of what Moses did. <clears throat> and another thing, the, the spiritual choices that we make can actually affect our eternal life. It may be a startling statement when you think about that. But this freedom of choice that God has given us, if we don't, if we don't, if we don't exercise that in a godly way, we can actually nullify what God has given us. Let's go over to, uh, Paul teaches us that. Let's go over to Romans 8. Of course, no one would put any water up here. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Romans 8. Uh, let's drop down to verse 9. And again, I'm going to be using the uh, NLT. Romans 8 says, Paul says, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you, verse 10, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have made, been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God, God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Therefore, verse 12, dear brothers and sisters, brethren, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. That person looking back at you in the mirror again, like James mentioned. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. That's what overcoming is all about. Making those choices to overcome. And that's a conscious effort on our parts. I know about you, but it sure is with me. <laughs> Verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. <laughs> and did you catch what he told the folks here? It says, when you're called to repent... Thank you. It took a child to take care of an old man. You notice that? <laughs> Thank you. Anybody have any idea where I was? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what, what Paul was telling the brethren here is that when we're called, when we repent, we're baptized, we have God's Holy Spirit enter, enter into us. 
in a very real sense, we're entering, if you think about that, if you want to look at it this way, we're entering into a partnership with God through Jesus Christ, through that process that he called us into. And, and, and it goes on to say that instead of being led by the choices of your human nature is what he's saying, now with God's Holy, Holy Spirit, we can make godly choices. Remember the, remember the, the term that Christ used uh, back in John 14 and 15 where he, where he termed God's Holy Spirit as the helper, as the comforter to help us through that process. Verse 15. So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. It doesn't force you, shove you, drag you. You have the responsibility to make those choices. And it goes on to say here in verse 15. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit. That, to me, that partnership. <laughs> to affirm that we are God's children. And since we're his children, verse 17, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we're heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also, also share his suffering. We have to choose to follow Christ wherever he may lead, no matter what that costs us. And who hasn't been faced with those, with those costs from time to time? Verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory we will re we, he will reveal to us later. For all creation, verse 19, is waiting eagerly for that future day, part of what we're picturing here at the feast, when God will reveal who his children really are. <laughs> so it says that if we're led by God's Holy Spirit, that we're the sons of God now and in a future tense. But, we, again, we can choose not to follow the leading of God's Holy Spirit. We can choose not to do that. And by doing that, we can actually nullify that gift that God gave to us, which is His Holy Spirit, which is His calling, the understanding we have. Uh, <laughs> along with everything else that He's done for us personally, we can nullify it all by making uh, really, really, really bad choices. So, uh, to me, that just kind of brings home the importance of, of this whole topic. It matters a great deal what we do, how, do we con how we conduct ourselves, uh, how we, the behaviors that we uh, exhibit in our life. Chip talked about that in the sermonette. <coughs> matters a great deal. But we have to choose to do that. <coughs> we have to take that responsibility. I, don't, <coughs> I, look at, I look out and I see an awful lot of gray heads, white heads, uh, and sometimes no hair at all. No. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Glenn. Sorry, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I'm trying to get at here, if you've been around long enough, you, you've, you've, heard, you've, heard this, you've heard something about church. Well, you remember when church government was um, heavily emphasized. Heavily emphasized. Isn't that an oxymoron? Well, <laughs> we'll have to have our uh, chief editor take care of that one for me. But this was the teaching of the church. God will not allow anyone in his family that, cannot, that he cannot govern. He won't allow anyone into his family that he cannot govern. Heard someone say one time that that was dead wrong. And I have to say I partly agree with that. Yes, we have to submit to God. Of course we do. We have to obey God. Uh, we have to have God's rule in our life. But that was always in the context. That statement uh, presented to us was always in the context of church government. A.K.A. God's government on earth. That's what it was. If you didn't submit to that, then you weren't submitting to God. I still have all those papers. I don't, I don't look at them anymore. You know, we're past that, right? I hope we are. You know, that's a maturing process. And we choose to move past that. I hope we all have. <clears throat> but let's rephrase that statement a little bit. I don't believe that God is going to allow anyone into his family that won't choose to govern themselves. <clears throat> you see, if God gives us the, the freedom to choose, led by his Holy Spirit, would he then make us control us like automations? God wouldn't do that. He doesn't do that. <clears throat> if, he, if he did, why do we need this guidebook on how to conduct our lives? <laughs> we have a Bible example directly in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles over in Zechariah 14. If you turn there, and the setting there, the day of the Lord, this will probably be mentioned during the feast. <coughs> I 
over in Zechariah 14. In Zechariah 14, uh, let's go down to verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. That's Jehovah, Yahweh. And to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up, nations will willfully choose not to come up to the feast, to, uh, to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. On them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt, and that's probably a reference to me, that's a reference to the Arab nations. They want to hang on to that Sharia law. They don't want God's law in their life. Will not come up and enter in. They shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. <laughs> and the example here is that uh, early on in the millennium, because of obstinate human nature, God's going to have to force some stubborn people to keep the holy days to control them externally by withholding grain and allowing plagues, all that. He's going to have to do that. He's going to have to force people. But that, doesn't there come a point where that becomes internalized, where people want to do the things that God wants them to do? They choose to do what God wants them to do. They choose to obey God because they know that's the right thing. <laughs> We've come to that point, and people in the future will too. They just realize it's the best, best thing, and they believe it with all of their being. No one has to push them or force them into it at some point. And I'll say it again. I don't believe anyone's going to be in the family of God who won't eventually, by the time this is all said and done, to govern themselves. We just have to do that. Let's take a brief look at, at, a, at an example, a very familiar example. You don't really need to turn to the we We've mentioned this so many times, but it's Isaiah 14. Here's a being didn't, who didn't govern himself properly. He didn't. He chose to rebel against God. And in Isaiah 14, 12, uh, beginning in verse 12, How you are falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, and he used a whole bunch of, I will ascend, I will exalt my throne, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, I will ascend above the, I will be like the Most High. You think there's a process, thought process going on there? <laughs> Satan making all those really bad choices, those rebellious choices against God? They're contrary to God in every way. <laughs> but, again, the, the point I'm trying to make for us is that the selfishness that we're reading about here is the same exact result will happen to us, quite frankly. In, <clears throat> we'll end up in the same place, the lake of fire, if we don't choose to humble ourselves before the great and almighty God. We just will. I just believe that wrong choices can, can uh, get us in a lot of trouble. And we have some warnings from Peter. Over in, uh, I have a couple of reference, reference scriptures. First Peter. Or First Peter 2. NLT, again. Paraphrase is okay if it doesn't, doesn't destroy the intent of the scripture. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage against your very soul. <clears throat> and that's a war that rages every day in our lives where we have a choice. We can, we, can, uh, we can choose to be influenced by Satan, the world around us, or we can choose to be influenced by what God tells us in his word. That's a choice we make. We make that every day. Verse 12, be careful to live properly, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and it, it, it's an unselfish reason when we put it in the context of what Peter's telling us here. Be careful, verse 12, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, Doing wrong in those eyes. You know, people don't understand. They don't understand why you keep the Sabbath. They don't understand why you keep the feast. You lose your job. Are you nuts? <laughs> we have to make a living, right? 
But going on here in verse 12, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. One day they will understand. One day. So that's a secondary result of the choices we make. And we seldom think of that. <laughs> but remember how Peter ended his letter in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy to the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How does he devour us? He swallows us up by his ways, by his choices, not ours, not God's. He just eats us alive with that. Stand firm. 1 Peter 5, 8, or I'm sorry, 9 says, Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. <laughs> it's not my topic to go into faith, but faith involves a whole bunch of choices. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. So God gives us the freedom to choose, but we have to choose how we do that, how we exercise those. He won't force us into his kingdom. He refuses to do that. In fact, he loves us so much that he'll throw us in the lake of fire before he allows us to be there like that being we just read about in uh, Isaiah 14. We have to make those life choices every day of our life. And you have to ask yourself, do those choices affect our eternal life? Well, we have all kinds of scriptures that bear that out. Over in Matthew 16. We... <coughs> You know, I'll give all the speakers. I'll give all the speakers away here. You know, we have a clock. We have a timer back there. It's doing a countdown. So if you're getting really sleepy and you, you, you just turn around, glance at the clock, and you see how much longer. You have. <laughs> I can't see it very well. And <laughs> Matthew 16, verse 24. I'm sorry. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 20. And we know the story here. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one he was the Christ. Uh, and let's go down to verse 22. Then Peter took him aside. We know this story. And rebuked him. And, you know, he says, uh, it's not, he's, not going to, he's not going to reject Christ. But, he turned, but Christ turned to Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. <clears throat> You're an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. We have to choose the things to be mindful of. All of us. Just like Christ was telling Peter here. Verse 24. Then Peter said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's daily choosing to follow him. <laughs> and not something we do once, and then that, that's it. <laughs> Verse 25. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, his own life, his, own, his eternity? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each for what? According to his works, what he or she has done with their life. And that all the boys involve choices on an ongoing basis. Another scripture uh, over in uh, Paul was inspired to write this over in First uh, Corinthians nine. And again, this is, this has to do with choices. We have to choose eternal life. Is what I'm getting at. <laughs> over in First Corinthians nine. It's from the New King James, uh, down in verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Again, that's a reference to eternal life. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. And here's his spiritual fight. He tells us what his spiritual fight is. 
but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. That sounds like choices to me. He's choosing to deny himself certain things to stay on top of them, as he puts it, to, to <laughs> keep under his body, to keep control of his mind-thinking processes. <clears throat> Those things he, he does physically, in, in a physical frame of mind. But going on in verse 27, lest... When I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. And the King James says, we know, cast away. He's talking about eternal life there, isn't he? Yes, he is. His pretty clear choices have everything to do with our eternal life. You know, I, 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 I think we all personally want to be a member of God's family. And that means we have to make certain choices. Like Paul, choices completely against our carnal nature, and that's a daily struggle. Daily. I always look at that old guy looking back at me mirror in the morning and say, okay, what, what, what are you going to do today? What kind of trouble are you going to get into today? <laughs> uh, when today are you not going to control your mouth or uh, control your thoughts or something like that, you know, every day. And, 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 you know, sometimes people have to come to the point of understanding this whole concept. Spiritual choices are their re personal responsibility. And they have to come to that point before they actually start making progress in their life. Because people will go into denial. They just will. Nothing wrong with me. <laughs> you know, you know, organizations like AA understand that. They use this 12-step program. <clears throat> but it, they understand that it all boils down that the individual has to take respons responsibility to themselves and start telling themselves, no, I won't have any more alcohol. I won't. You know, and that, that applies to any kind of addiction. Kind of like Paul disciplining himself. He told himself, no, how many times? We, we don't know. Maybe we can ask him someday. So the point there again is, is this, this idea, this gift of choices, of choosing that God gives us. He places that responsibility right back on our shoulders, squarely on our, our shoulders. And, I, and I'm not talking about gaining eternal life through works. It's not possible. <laughs> but we do have certain things to, to show God we have to prove to him that we want the, that eternal life we have to choose that and again we can choose not to we can neglect it that's a choice if you think about it neglecting uh, the things we should be doing and our, our choices can lead us to a closer relationship with God it can lead him away from, or, or away from God it's just that simple really uh, let's turn over to Isaiah 65 and this will probably be also be mentioned later on during the feast. But the ancient Israel in Ezekiel 65, the context here is speaking about consequences of any people that choose to forsake God. Isaiah 65, verse 12. Therefore, I will number you for the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Yeah, those words are in the scripture. And uh, just jumping over a chapter to Isaiah 66 and verse 4, where God says, I will choose their delusions <laughs> and bring their fears on them because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Here's the people that consciously chose not to obey God. You know, they had their idolatry, they had all kinds of things they got into. That was their choice rather than God. And, you know, we're, we're sitting here at the feast, you know, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to rectify some of that. <laughs> In spite of all the bad behaviors and choices that mankind's made, humankind has done, uh, they're going to be re-educated. And, and we're going to have a part in that. Talks a little, about that, a little bit about that over in Isaiah 30. In Isaiah 30, from the New King James, dropping down to verse 20. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers, those that will educate, form, direct, instruct, they won't drive or beat people into submission. 
will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Make this choice, not that one. We know, we know what you're thinking. <laughs> we, we know the direction you're heading in. Don't go that way. <laughs> this is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand, whenever you turn to the left. You make a decision whenever you turn to the right or the left. <laughs> of course, this is talking in a broader context, but we do all the time. Verse 22. You will also defile the coverings of your images of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold. Sound like false religious images to me. You'll throw them away as an unclean thing. You will say to them, get away. All the, all the idolatry we see today, uh, people will come to see what it's done to them. They're, they're, <laughs> you know, I was driving around the other day in, uh, in Post Falls, and, <clears throat> and it's striking to me. I, I know... Uh, I thought Washington was Washington, uh, of course, California, Oregon, and Washington, you know, the, the liberalism of California is kind of spreading like a cancer up the West Coast. But even when I was driving around uh, yesterday, what I saw a lot of were taverns. There's taverns just on just about every corner, a bar of some kind, and uh, cannabis shops. What's wrong with us as a people? <laughs> Anyhow, <clears throat> hopefully we're going to tell people, you know, that, that's really not the way you want to live. <laughs> no, no matter what people kind of try to tell, they tell you. But over in, uh, here's another famous scripture. Over in Deuteronomy 30. I'm sure you know exactly where I'm going. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. New King James. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil, in, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgment. That's all about right choices. That you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, really bad choices, I announce to you today that you shall perish. And God never changes. He never compromises with our choices. He wants us to, to make right choices, godly choices. He goes on to say, You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. Verse 19 is the one we're getting at. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. It's the same for us. Do we want eternal life? The choice is ours. Again, we can choose not to accept that. That both you and your descendants may live. The last part of verse 19. Verse 20. That you may love the Lord your God. That you may obey his voice. And that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord sw swore to your fathers. To Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. <laughs> and, and just kind of summing it up. You know, we want, we choose to love, glorify, and honor God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we want and we choose to put our hope in God through all the trials and things that we suffer in this life. And we want and we choose to put our trust in God for the protection and the help that He offers to us. No matter what comes to us in this way of life. You know, there's a, there's a psalm that I really like. It kind of speaks to that. What God does for us, the protection, the help He gives us. And it's Psalm 91. I'm going to beat the clock, by the way, if you're watching the clock. Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We're familiar with those names. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah throughout here. Verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor any of the other terrors that we have. There's lots of terrorism in the world. Nor of the arrow that flies by day. Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness. Nor of the destruction that lays waste in 
at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but that shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Lincoln? See the reward of the, of the wicked, <laughs> of, the, of the bad choices. You know, just drive around. <laughs> Verse 9. Because you have made the Lord, the eternal, Jehovah, Yahweh, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. That's where we want to be. That's where we, we, want to, we want to dwell in our lives. We want to dwell in our thinking. We want to have those mindful things of God and not so much of the world. You know, we can't escape it, but we do have a choice to, of how we, whether we absorb it or not, whether we reject it or not. Verse 10, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give you... He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread down the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Known God's name. We know God's name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's choose life, brethren. Let's live God's way in everything that we do each and every day. And let's enjoy the feast here.